The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ebody and X, and this is The Candid Frame. Rock and roll and photography have always been intertwined. It's always been sound and the image. Whether it was in the age of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley, or now with Beyonce and Alabama Shakes. As the artists went out to perform their music in front of thousands, there have been photographers both at the foot of the stage and behind the scenes. This has created legends in music and in photography, including photographers like Jim Marshall, Lynn Goldsmith, and Henry Diltz. Photographer Danny Clinch is undoubtedly not only one of the best photographers today, but he certainly has helped define what music looks like with his iconic images of Tupac Shakur, Dolly Parton, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, Joan Jett, and Tony Bennett. You can see these and other photographs of his in Danny Clinch Still Moving, which contains just a sampling of musical greats. Danny is as generous as he is talented, and our conversation was easily one of the best that I've had this year. It's so good that I didn't have the heart to cut it down to our usual length. So, we are releasing this episode in two parts, the first of which you'll be enjoying in just a few minutes. But do yourself a favor and make sure to check out his website. And when you have the chance, pick up a copy of his book. It's easily one of my favorites of the year. I'll have a link in the show notes. But now, Danny Clinch. Well, Danny, thank you so much for uh, making time for me this morning. I'm a great, great fan of your work. A friend of mine showed me uh, a copy of your book recently, and I was just like, why haven't I talked to this guy sooner? Well, I appreciate that, and uh, I have been checking out some of the other podcasts and uh, really enjoying them. Oh, great. Very great. insightful and uh, and inspiring, to be honest. I, I wanted to start talking to you about uh, you, know, you coming up uh, as a kid because I know your your mom was a was an avid photographer and your dad was into music and cars, all of which uh, played an important role in your life in in your work. Tell tell me about your your parents and you growing up and why those things you know became so important in your life. I think that uh, you know my mother was taking photographs all the time as a kid. She's pretty much the snapshot queen. And uh, still photographs to this day. And uh, I have said in the past that I have um, lots of photographs of her photographing because uh, I get so much enjoyment from it. But she was a huge inspiration to me. And then I found out later on also that not only uh, uh, was my mother an avid photographer, but my grandfathers on both sides of my family um, were took photographs. And uh, at one point, I asked my father, I said, you have so many photographs of uh, your family as a young, as a young kid, but you know, who was taking all those photos? And he said, well, my father was. And I said, well, he's in a lot of the photos. He said, yeah, he was, you know, tied a piece of fishing string to the camera and put it on a table or, you know, I don't even think he had a tripod and he had rigged it up so that he could be in the photos. And of course you look at the photos and his hands are behind his back or look like they're in his pocket or something. And it was really cool to, um, you know, to know that he was really into taking photographs as well. And they wasn't like they had a lot of money, you know, it was like, uh, he must've really enjoyed it and got out of his way to find himself a camera, you know, and to shoot and to process the film and all that. So, and then, uh, you know, my, there, you know, my dad, was uh, and my mom are both big music fans and so there was a lot of music around the house and and uh, a lot of it was you know 50s uh late 50s music and you know my father had pretty much like one eight track tape cassette that lived through many of uh the cars that we had which was you know had earth angel and the big bopper and some elvis and uh you know richie valens and buddy holly and stuff and and so i grew up listening to that all the time and um, i just had a love of music and art early on. And of course, when I was asked what I wanted to do as a kid, as a, you know, teenager, 
I decided that um, photography was something I wanted to pursue. And at that point, I had actually started to ha- carry a camera around with me all the time. I, I kind of appropriated a camera from uh, the kid across the street who had a Pentax K1000. He bought the camera because he thought he wanted to take photos, and then he never really did. And I'd always go over there, and it'd be sitting on the table, and I'd pick it up, and, you know, wow, this is great. And, yeah. and one day I just said, hey, can I borrow your camera? <laughs> he said, yeah, go ahead. And, then, you know, that was it. It was mine. You know, well, you, you, your work is so revolved so much around around music, but I was kind of curious, do you have like a, an album that you listened to or that you purchased as a kid that really made you realize how magical music could be? Yeah, I would say, or a couple, the one that really springs to mind is I remember getting Neil Young, uh, Decade, and it was the double album, and it was a record, and I put it on. And I would sit in my room and just stare at the album cover and the inside photographs and and uh, and listen to that record. So that and after the Gold Rush too was one that I listened to all the time. But I was listening to uh, a lot of Bruce Springsteen and the Allman Brothers and um, Bob Seger. Uh, the Live Bullet record was huge for me. You know, I really I was into a lot of of. Uh, of different music, it, you know, I, I sort of got passed by on 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 punk rock and only discovered it later. But my um, sort of uh, mentor musically was my friend's older my friend's older brother, who was listening to, like I said, Skinner, the Allman Brothers, Springsteen, Bob Seger, Jackson Brown, all that stuff. So we were we were getting a heavy dose of that. So so a lot of it came from there. And realizing later on that a lot of that music is kind of blues based and being able to see later on, you know, how much of an influence Muddy Waters uh, and Jimmy Reed uh, had on those on those bands. And now I'm like, I'm a pretty big blues fan as well. So how, how much of your connection to that music was born of the fact that you felt like that you related to what they were singing about or how they were singing about it, that it's somehow connected to who you were um, at, at the time. Did that play a big role? You know, role I'm, I think well, certainly uh, Bruce Springsteen was singing about New Jersey, and I'm from New Jersey. And uh, really, I'm, you know, 30 minutes from where Bruce Springsteen grew up. And in fact, uh, he is, um, you know, a couple of years younger than my dad, and they grew up in the same, basically, in the town next to each other. And so a lot of these um, songs about, you know, the, the loners and the greasers and the people who had cars and, you know, and that sort of thing was like, that was what, that was my dad. And so a lot of that stuff resonated with me. You know, the Bob Seger stuff was um, also about young love and and uh, I feel like a number and like things like that, which was also really interesting. So a lot of that stuff, it, I, I could relate to it in that regard. And then just whatever really felt good and sounded good. And, you know, I was just into melodies and uh, certainly lyrics, but the melodies and the music itself was something that I really would, uh, would gravitate towards the, your first forays into photographing musicians was you sneaking into concerts with your your camera is that right yeah you know back then of course there were no cell phones and you know i had to have film with me so i would take a camera body and a lens and or two and some film and i would kind of distribute it amongst my friends you know give uh, give a friend uh, a lens, give a friend uh, the film, and you know I'd like literally stick the camera body d- down my pants so that nobody would notice that I had a camera. <laughs> and then we get inside, and I'd put it all together, and my friends would just say like, you know, oh, all right, well there goes Danny. You know, <laughs> put the camera together, and I'd grab my film, and I'd try and go up front, uh, make my way slowly up front to to photograph, and uh, I really, you know. That's how I've enjoyed a show, and it's to this day I'm the same way. Like I, I can go to a show and sit and watch the whole thing, but man, if I have a camera in my hand and I'm allowed to go photograph, like I'm just, I'm just having a great time. And the fact that I get to do it on a regular basis uh, for a living is really a, a blessing yeah. for me. A, a pivotal key in, your, in the beginning of your career was taking a workshop at the uh, Ansel Adams uh, workshop space. Yeah, and um, you took a class with. Annie Leibovitz, which led you to be, um, become her intern and eventually an, an assistant. Tell us a story about that, about how that, you know, being a workshop participant led you to become uh, the intern yeah. for, for Annie. Well, you know, I was at a point where I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my photography. And I was a big fan of 
uh, Interview Magazine and Rolling Stone. And I was, you know, a big music fan, of course. And I, uh, I would look at Interview Magazine and see these really awesome photographs of musicians and, and, you know, celebrities, actors, authors, etc. And, you know, the photographers were Herb Ritz and, you know, Andy Leibovitz and folks like that. And I started to, you know, to be inspired by that stuff. And, and I honestly, really, I didn't have a plan. My plan was just that I love to take photographs and I was going to go out and see what I could do with it. So at a certain point, I decided um, that I could do a photographic workshop. In fact, my my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, Maria, was uh, went to FIT and she had an opportunity to study uh, Shakespeare in London. And, you know, I'm, I'm you know, a, a guy from New Jersey, you know, uh, my dad's a house painter. And, you know, I, I honestly didn't have any idea that you could go to London <laughs> and study Shakespeare. And it would kind of open my eyes to like, wow, you know, look at this. This is a great big world. And there's a lot out there. Like, how can I go out and take advantage of it? And I started to look around at how could I do a workshop, you know, and I, and I, I was looking in one of the, I think one of the photography magazines and I see this, uh, you know, Ansel Adams gallery workshop and, uh, the, the instructors are Annie Leibovitz and David Hockney. And I thought, wow, uh, this, this could be really exciting. And I was a big fan of Annie's, especially, uh, her early work, uh, the documentary, uh, side of her work. And I decided, uh, I, you know, I, I said, Hey, I'm going to do this. Right. So I, I uh, looked into the Ansel Adams Gallery Workshop and the Friends of Photography Workshops in um, Carmel, California, which uh, was the photograph as a document. And uh, I'm just a big fan of the document and journalism and that. And um, so I I went out to Yosemite and Annie was teaching there and uh, I ran into her assistant at the time, David Rose, and we kind of hit it off. There was people of all uh, types there. There were you know, older and younger folks and, uh, you know, some people who took wedding photographs and some people who were art photographers and journalists and, and that. And of course, David Hockney was there, which was really exciting. And But I sort of um, started to hang out with David Rose and I was, you know, really there for Annie. And I didn't even know that much about David Hockney, uh, although that became really exciting as well. He was doing the Polaroid series at the time, and uh, it was an incredible body of work, and it was really – he's such an outside-the-box thinker. It was really nice to spend time with him and be inspired by what he had done with photography. And so I started to skip some of the other classes to do the Annie, the Annie uh, classes. And so uh, there would be like other photographers that were teaching there, and I would, I would go and, and hang out with, uh, with Annie and Dave. And it was a, it was a great opportunity for me and a great learning experience. And, and it was exciting. And I, I think for, you know, young photographers who really want to immerse themselves in photography and surround themselves with like-minded people, it's just a great opportunity to do that, to go to a workshop and be with the other students and see what their strengths are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, how you can learn from them, find a mentor. Like those things were so, so valuable to me. And um, about, you know, Three quarters of the way through the workshop, Dave said to me, um, you know, Annie is, has told me to keep my eye open for, for someone who's got like some good energy and stuff like because we need an intern at the studio in New York. He said, would you be interested in that? And I was like, oh, man, I, I just checked my calendar and I'm free, you know, sign me up. And uh, so I ended up getting that opportunity and Annie then came and asked me if I wanted to intern at the studio and I was just really super excited about it. Of course, I, I, um, I agreed to do it and uh, I went off to the other workshop uh, just completely free and excited because one of my plans was to go to LA afterwards and try and find a job with like, you know, Matthew Ralston or Herb Ritz or, you know, or just go around and kick the tires and see what I could find. But I didn't have to anymore because I had, you know, my photographic hero was invited me to intern at the studio there. And that was just a great time for me, a great time in my life. And I went out and I did the other workshop, which was incredible. And just, um, you know, moved to New York City and started to intern for Annie. Yeah. When, when they, they picked you, you know, they were they were looking for more than someone who knew something about photography. You say, you know, you described it have, as having good energy. But, you know, you've been in the position where you've, you know, have, have people come to you now and ask to to work for you and you're having to choose people. You know, when you when you think back as to what you think you they saw in you, 
what is it that they saw in you and that you look for in other people when when you know when you're having to choose someone to to come and come on board your team and help you what what yeah. is that i've realized that um you know the friends i've made over the years and it's great to um you know, have a creative team that you work with and, and the people that work in your studio and the people who come up through through your studio, your assistants and all that, you know, it's like, it's like family, you know, it's a great, for me it is. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the type of person that, you know, I, I, I care about people a lot and I care about my crew and the people around me. And I feel like I want like-minded people around me. And I've, I've, I've discovered that like, you know, it's really the, the curious people, the people who are really driven and who are really curious about anything in general, you know, not just photography, but life and life experience. And for me, one of the great things that I've gotten from photography is really great life experiences. I mean, I love people. I love music. I love traveling, meeting new friends. But the people that have stuck around for me are the people who are are curious, you know, and they're bringing something to the table too. These are people where you give them an assignment and they go above and beyond what the assignment is. And they're bringing something to the table that you didn't think of. Um, you know, what better way to, to uh, sort of collaborate with, with people and to work than, let, let me just say, what, what better way to work than to have other collaborators who are just as curious as you are and are like-minded are like searching out things that I may have missed and bringing other things to the table. Um, there's a, uh, a, a photographer and a DP named Josh Goldman who started working at my studio as a, an intern back in the day, many, many years ago. And he helped me with my transition into digital photography because he was a young guy who understood, you know, digital photography. And uh, he has a similar aesthetic as I do. And we like a lot of the same things. And, and now when I do my film projects, like he's my DP and he started as an intern at my studio. Hmm. When people have the opportunity to study with photography, I remember there was a photographer whose work I was taking a look at it, and I was going, "Wow, this looks really familiar." And then I looked, I looked at their background, and I realized that they had uh, been an assistant for Mary Ellen Mark, and they had taken a lot of her aesthetics in terms of how. Yeah. And 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 I, and I was like, "Oh, wow, that's really kind of interesting." But you know, you had the opportunity to work for Annie, but you, you take a look at your work, and your work is really distinctively your own. Mm. You may have taken some inspiration and some insight from working with her, but it seems like you're your own unique photographer. Can you tell us about, you know, the, the time that you spent with her and how, you know, you came to, to feel like I'm not her, but I need to create my own voice and what, what yeah. you know, how did that evolve? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And it's interesting because, uh, first of all, I loved your Mary Ellen Mark conversation. Oh, thanks. It was incredible. And that was the first one I listened to because I'm such a fan of hers. And I, I worked for him, for Mary Ellen Mark as well. I worked with her for um, a couple of months, you know, straight. It was a great experience. She's a really intense person. I learned a lot from her. And, you know, people have asked me about my style and young photographers asking me about my style and how I, how I shoot and why and all those sort of things. And I think back to working for Annie and the idea that, you know, man, I, like I wanted to be Annie Leibovitz, you know, like I wanted to, I wanted to light things that way and I wanted to do things that way. And I wanted to have these, I thought I wanted to have these big productions and I started to learn how that was done. I mean, she never takes no for an answer. She never takes no for an answer. She um, is really driven and she really gets things done and she has a lot of patience and attention to detail and like all these stylists and I, we worked with the best stylists and the best prop people. Like it's really, really exciting. And there was a certain point in my life where I just realized like I was never going to be Annie. You know, like I don't have that much patience to create these huge concepts and, and bring them to the table and, and put them on people and all those things that she does so successfully. Like I just realized I actually didn't really have any interest in that. I learned a lot from her about, um, you know, posing people and getting them comfortable and how to treat people and, and that sort of thing, which was incredible. And because I worked with Annie, that's how I got to work with Mary Ellen Mark. And that's how I got to work with Stephen Mizell. And I worked with Stephen Mizell right after Annie because her agent worked with Stephen as well. Hmm. So it was really cool. I worked with Annie for a year and I like really absorbed a lot and I learned a lot. It was like really incredible. And there were times when assistants would come through and they'd work with us a couple of days as a freelancer and they go, man, you know, you're working so hard. Like, why don't you come and work with us? We're photographing, uh, you know, models and we have wine at lunch and, you know, it's just so easy and fun. And, and I was like, no, man, this is where I belong. I belong right here and I'm going to work my ass off and make this happen. And I think also, 
you know, people say, oh, you're so lucky you worked for Annie. And in fact, I wasn't lucky at all. You know, it's like I worked my butt off to get there, to put myself in the position. You know, I had to save my money to go to the workshop, first of all, and to put myself in the position to be there to benefit from uh, from that opportunity that I had. And then once I got it, I had to I had to step up and, and really be a, a solid part of the team in order to you know, to continue to grow and then become, you know, basically our second assistant and traveling around with her and that. And so when I moved from Annie uh, to Stephen Mizell and I got there and Stephen, you know, learned a lot from studying Avedon and all that. And so like I was, I was learning things from Stephen that kind of surprised me because I wasn't really a fashion type guy, you know, like I wasn't like, I didn't see myself as wanting to become a fashion photographer, but I realized, you know, he could see light in a really beautiful way. And he would often, you know, shoot uh, on a rooftop as the sun is down and there's like barely any light up there. And he would go to a half of a second or a quarter of a second on a medium format camera and photograph. And it surprised me how beautiful the film looked and how silvery the light was at that time of day and, and things like that. And these are, this is back when, you know, you couldn't just look at the back of your camera and see what you, what you were getting and say like, Oh wow, this actually looks cool. I would have never thought, you know, like you had to wait and see. I, I do feel like, uh, I have a real distinctive memory of photographing someone with Steven Mizell and, just being amazed that he was actually shooting in this kind of light. Like I could tell the light was beautiful, but I never thought you could pull something out of it. Mm. Taking all that stuff. So, so to get back to the anything and what I learned there and what I learned through Steven and what I learned through Mary Ellen Mark were the things that like I decided to take that suited my personality. And I realized at a certain point, like I'm not Annie and I'm not Mary Ellen or Steven, but there's a lot of stuff they do that I love and I'm going to take that stuff and apply it to my personality. So I might not be Annie and I might not be Stephen or Mary Ellen Mark, but I'm going to take the things that I learned from them and see what suits my personality. And I'm more spontaneous. I like to move fast. I like to chase the light, uh, all those things that, uh, that I get excited about. And I took them and I realized, you know, finally I got to say to myself, oh, wow, okay, I don't want to be Annie. I want to be, I want to be me. And, you know, at a certain point, I like wide angle lenses. I like tri I like getting really close to people. I like being in the middle of things. You know, uh, I, I don't like necessarily to have a long lens and be far away and throw the background out of focus. You know, like some people like that and that's their style. Well, I like cars. I like music. I like motorcycles. You know, I like being in the middle of things. I like Polaroid cameras. I like, uh, you know, spontaneity. And, um, you know, I like natural light, although I can really become really good at adding the light where I want it to look natural. Uh, these are the things that I like, and these are the things that have become my style. So, um, that's really, um, how I see it. And, uh, and I enjoy sharing that information with, with younger photographers because, uh, it's exciting to discover your own self and your own style. Conversations like this one with Danny Clinch is what keeps me inspired to put all the work and time that I do for the candid frame. This is the kind of insight and inspiration that I was often hungry for as a young photographer and even as an older one. It's just gold when a photographer as talented and amazing as Danny is so generous in talking about their work and career. I think it's conversations like this that really set the bar for the work that we do here at TCF. And I hope you feel the same. Because it's this kind of conversation that I want to bring to you every week. If you are enjoying this conversation and the many that we've provided to you over the past weeks, months, or years, now is a great time to become a part of what we're building here. Through Patreon, you can support the show with the regular monthly donations of $2, $5, $10, $25 or more, or anything in between. Your donations of any amount are the means by which we will improve the show and bring you more great conversations with the world's best photographers. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at The Candid Frame. Thanks.
When did you start coming into your own as, as a photographer? I mean, we've been talking about you working for others, but when did it start happening that you were, you know, creating your own own niche? You know, I feel like um, when I was got interested in photography and I, I went to a community college for two years and, um, and then I went to the New England School of Photography in Boston and I felt like uh, I'd gone two years of the community college and then I looked into um, School of Visual Arts and RISD and I looked at um, Brooks and, you know, all these places. And I, some of them I went to, some of them I, I couldn't afford to go to and check out. But everybody wanted to disregard all the credits that I had from the community college. They wanted me to take science and language and English and this, that, and the other thing and go for another four years. And I was like, man, I, I'm, I'm getting impatient here. I want to learn photography and I want to take that and I want to take pictures. So uh, I went to the New England School of Photography and started shooting there. And, but one of the things that happened to me was when I was at the community college, like I was looking at the other photographers that were taking the class there, you know, I was in visual communications and I looked around and I thought, you know, how am I, how am I matching up to these other people? And, uh, and do I feel like I have something that's a, that's a, you know, a unique point of view, my point of view. And I started to feel like I was, I was getting it. And I, uh, I have a very close family and I've been photographing my family for years and I took a photograph of my two nephews and my niece. I felt like it transcended like a regular family photo. And uh, there was a couple of reasons why. One of them was that my mom, who was wearing like a polka dotted blouse, had stuck her arm in the frame to hold up my niece, who was really, really young because she was afraid that the boys were going to drop her when I was taking the photo. And it was like that little surprise that you didn't see right away. And then you realized it was an adult arm holding the kid up. And it, it just to me, like I felt like uh, I was like, wow, I feel like I feel like I do have a point of view. I feel like I, I'm, I'm observant and I feel like maybe I could be really good at this. So that was the first moment. And then when uh, I finished working with Annie, uh, I was still assisting. Um, I was starting to get work from um, – Spin Magazine, and a friend of mine was the assistant photo editor there, and I got an assignment to shoot a band called Third Base. I had photographed smaller assignments for other magazines and stuff here and there, but this was Spin Magazine, and this was, you know, a big band at the time. And I went out and I I did the shoot, and I really felt like I did a good job. Like, and I looked at the photographs, and I was like, man, I could see these in a magazine. Like, this is going to be incredible. And when they did run in the magazine, I felt really confident that I could probably do this. And, um, you know, I think there are a lot of things you have to get over as a photographer, uh, or as an artist in general, where you're like, you're not reinventing the wheel. A lot of things have been done before, but you know, have they been done by me and have they been done from my perspective and my point of view and my style that I've developed over the years? And you have to, I think that's an important part as an artist to be able to let go of all those like insecurities and just go for it, yeah. you know? At that point, I did feel like uh, I was onto something, and I was able to bring those photographs to Def Jam Records, who had um, third base on their label. And I talked my way into meeting the uh, the guys who ran their design department, which was called the, the Drawing Board, and it was um, Say Adams and Steve Carr, and they were have you know are now legendary uh, guys in in hip hop for all the great album packaging that they've. Um, uh, designed over the years. And I got my foot in the door there and started shooting uh, for Def Jam uh, early on. And the exciting thing about that was that the photographers that I admired, uh, you know, Herb Ritz and Annie and these folks, like they weren't really interested in shooting hip hop because um, everybody thought it was a fad. And so they were hiring young photographers to uh, to photograph these artists who were actually pretty, pretty well known at the time, Public Enemy and LL Cool J and you know, the Beastie Boys and bands like that. And so uh, I got my foot in the door there and it was really an exciting time for me. And I did some really kind of seminal hip hop records, one of them being the Nas Illmatic, which is always included in the top hip hop records of all time. And uh, just being able to, uh, you know, to just step into that world. And interestingly enough, like um, the uh, indie rock artists of the time, like uh, Jane's Addiction and the Chili Peppers and the Smashing Pumpkins, they were all hip hop fans. They all listened to Public Enemy, you know. And so when I started to show my work uh, to people, you know, to these other bands that I that I really liked as well, they were like, oh, man, you know, he's photographed, uh, you know, 
public enemy and you know like well, let's get this guy to do, to do the mm. work or whatever so it was interesting to see that translate into other work and and one of the things i'm most proud of it, you know in my work overall as a body of work is is that i never really got stuck in any genre of music and i've photographed public enemy and i've photographed tony bennett and uh, metallica and johnny cash you know Tupac and Willie Nelson and everyone in between. So um, it's been really exciting for me because I am such a huge music fan. It's interesting when I came out of that to just backtrack for a minute and think about when I took my portfolio to Def Jam, I felt like um, some people had told me that uh, because my portfolio was basically all black and white, that I would never work because, uh, you know, people aren't interested in just black and white photography and that, you know, you have to diversify, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I was looking for an agent at the time and that was what somebody told me. It's like, yeah, you you know, you're not going to get work like this and you have to change it. Um, uh, and in fact, I got a lot of work with that portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you look at, I look at your work and I think back to um, like the 60s and the 70s and photographers like Jim Marshall, Lynn Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. And there was the, 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 what's often talked about is, you know, the ready access mm -hmm. that these photographers had. And that a lot of people who shoot currently sort of lament those days because they say there's so much control and so many restrictions that, you know, a photographer can't shoot that way. But I look at your pictures. And I, I see them as analogous, analogous and as comparative to the images that were made in the 60s and the 70s. Um, so despite all the restrictions and all the, you know, all the rules that are imposed on photographers, what, what's allowed you to be able to create images that are comparable to that of some of the people that, you've, that you admired? Mm. Well, it's all about relationships, you know. I will say that I, became, I had become really good friends with Jim Marshall. And uh, I just loved his character and I loved his <laughs> his style of shooting. And there were a lot of people that had access and I feel like Jim had access, but he also had a great eye and a great sensitivity to uh, to the moment and um, and was really a, a, an amazing journalist. And I, I love his work. And he used to call me a uh, wannabe, uh, wannabe, you, know, you <laughs> wannabe, you wannabe Jim Marshall, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> if anybody that knows Jim would understand that completely. Boy, I'd love to hear a Jim Marshall podcast for sure. That guy, man, was something else. Oh, I would yeah. say. You know, it was all about – it's all about relationships and, and, and it has changed and people are um, very, very careful about who they let into their inner circle. And, and you know, I've been doing it so long and I've just become friends with so many or at least acquaintances with so many of the musicians and the managers and the publicists and the tour managers and the guitar techs and the, you know, the merch guy. Like I know all these people. I think, you know, if you're, if you're pure and honest and you, um, you know, you don't – try to go behind people's backs and stuff like it's it's worth missing something by being honest and and that because it'll it'll come back to you um around around it'll come back around later because you know it, it is about relationships and people i think at the end of the day you, you know i you realize that the musicians you know they do want their their lives documented they they, they do feel like they're doing important work and and uh and it's history you know but they're just not going to let anybody in there and I started relationships early on and this was able to get in at the tail end of, sure, come back and, and photograph on the tour bus or in the recording studio or things like that. I think that it's it, it's hard. It's trust, really. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like I, I could have a better answer to that. I usually uh, have a good answer for that. And, I, and in, in fact, uh, you know, for me, it's just been about developing um, – for me, at the end of the day, it's it's about relationships and it's about being truthful and honest with people. And, you know, no one's going to let you back into the dressing room and they're writing their set list if, uh, you know, if, if number one, you're going to get in the way mm -hmm. uh, or number two, you know, you know, like I'm there to be invisible. Uh, after all these years, I've, I've developed relationships with people. I can be part of the conversation, but I also know when I don't want to be part of the conversation and I want to get in there. I want to get the photograph I'm interested in and I want to get out of the way. And it's respecting the artists. It's respecting the people around them. And, um, and there's a real art to it. And I, and I really, I pride myself in that and being able to respect the people around me and be quiet and get the shot. And, you know, it's funny. I have, I'm staring right now at this photograph that I took. Um, it's on, uh, the screensaver for this, um, 
monitor in my studio. And it's a photograph of Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard and another friend of Willie's. And they're playing poker on Willie's tour bus. And there's like a pile of $20 bills and $100 bills and a big pile of weed in the middle of the table. And Merle Haggard's got poker face and he's looking at Willie uh, and he's got a joint in his hand. You know, I was invited on the tour bus because they all trusted me to go there and not get in the way, mm-hmm. not try to chat everybody up and just to get the document because they knew it was awesome. And, you know, a couple months later, Merle's gone and I have that photograph and it's just like a testament, I think, to relationships that I've had over the years uh, and and knowing how to read people. And Willie um, notoriously doesn't like doing photo sessions, but he doesn't mind being photographed. And so like if you realize that and you you are able to capture these great moments without getting in his way and without him feeling like he's uh, doing a photo shoot or something, then you're always welcome back. Yeah. Well, I like what I love what you're saying there about the idea that you're developing trust. It's not just about being invisible, though that plays a part in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's being about being able to sort of read people and being able to gauge yeah. when you can press it and when you need to sort of fall back. Uh, but you mentioned two photographers, Annie Leibovitz and Jim Marshall, who, uh, as you mentioned, are have very strong personalities and usually did not accept no for an answer. Mm. Um, when has that played a role in 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 your work? Where where you know you were pressed by someone and you were like, no, this is going to happen and it's going to happen my way. How can you give me an example of a time where you had to press it, but you still it was rooted in the fact that you had developed a level of trust and and understanding between you and and someone else. Yeah, you know that's not my personality. I find a way to work with what I'm given, and I will go for it, but I know when to back off and it's whatever I'm comfortable with. So I don't really demand too much, and I can't really think of a time when I've demanded too much. And I think a lot of times I'm asked to photograph people who don't really love the process of being photographed. Mm -hmm. You know, and with musicians, you know, they're not models and they're not actors. So they're entertainers. And at a certain point, there are some people uh, who understand that they're an entertainer. You know, Bob Dylan I photographed and Bruce Springsteen. And, you know, Bruce Springsteen is is a student of rock and roll photography and album covers and people and the way they're their stage presence and the way they present themselves. And so is Dylan. And those guys understand that. And they do present themselves a certain way and um, are part of the process because of that. And they're giving something back and it becomes like a nice little dance and a nice collaboration uh, between us. Um, but then there are some people who, you know, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a songwriter, I'm a singer or whatever. And I, I don't really ask to be photographed. I don't really love being photographed. I just want to make my art and do my thing. And then you have to, you have to work a little harder or just you have to find clever ways to, to capture the moment that you're looking to capture. I never really demand something from someone. It's just not my personality. I find different ways to, uh, to deal with it. And I've dealt with some really, you know, hardcore people who have been a real pain in the ass and, and, um, and I just like let them, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's like, it's just part of the life experience that I was talking about earlier. Like, how cool is it to like, you know, to be in a situation where, you know, this person is being like so completely difficult and it's almost just comical, you know, sometimes, (laughs) sometimes it's not, you know, cause you're there for a reason. And, you know, I do recall a band who, uh, you know, I don't know if they realized that they had hired me to shoot their photographs, but I went to the show and it was in the middle of nowhere and they needed press. They needed press for their for their record and their tour. And they were, you know, this was back in the day when they paid big money for photographers to go out and shoot album publicity, you know, and that or tour publicity. And they were p- paying me a decent amount of money. And the one guy just complained the whole time. And like, you know, after they made me wait hours and hours, uh, the guy then came out and there was like kind of drizzling outside. It was like maybe like a couple of raindrops here and there. And he just like, oh, he was just blew up. He was so mad that someone had dared to ask him to walk outside in the rain. And I just looked at them and I was like, you know, I'm getting paid either way. So you know, <laughs> I hated to play that card, but I just had to laugh. I was like, you guys realize how much money you're paying me and you're, and you're complaining about, you know, it's standing out here for a photo. I don't know. I think I got sidetracked, but uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's just funny. And that is a rare, rare occurrence for me. I mean, I pretty much, like I said, I, I enjoy the challenge of uh, of getting along with people and and uh, and and really having a good time while I'm photographing. And uh, and I have had several oppor- uh, I have had several times where the artist afterwards would say, like, man, that was a great hang. Like, I didn't even really feel like I was being photographed. I really enjoyed, awesome. uh, you know, that process. You know, that's how I ended up photographing Bob Dylan. I was photographing um, 
John Mellencamp and Dylan's publicist, Larry Jenkins, had said to me, man, I really like your style. Like you're really relaxed and, you know, but you're really getting it done and, and, uh, and the artist feels really comfortable. And, you know, I work with Bob Dylan and I'm going to recommend you uh, to him for one of his shoots. And I was like, well, all right, <laughs> go for it. And then I did, he did actually. And I ended up photographing Bob Dylan a couple of times. And you photographed him. Uh, you have a great story about photographing him at the uh, old ambassador hotel. Yeah. And how you expected only to have him for a limited amount of time and how it turned into a much lengthier shoot than you anticipated. Can you, can you talk about that and, and talk a little bit about the images that you made there? Because I think that I heard you talking about them and I thought that was it was really fascinating about how that whole shoot sort of evolved. Yeah. There's a great story uh, about that shoot coming together. And the the interesting thing is that I was really angling to shoot Bruce Springsteen and I sent a book of my photographs to Bruce's um, – uh, the woman who uh, – Sandy Churon, who was at the time designing all of Bruce's tour books and uh, and albums and stuff like that. And I sent her a book of photographs of mine called Discovery Inn. It was my first book of photos and said, I really love to photograph Bruce. Uh, you know, if there's ever an opportunity, you know, uh, think of me, please. So at the same time, I had done the Mellencamp shoot and Larry had suggested that Dylan work with me or whatever. And so – I got a call from Jeff Rosen, who is Bob Dylan's manager, who said to me, um, hey, I'm Jeff Rosen and I, I represent a singer-songwriter uh, who you may have heard of. His name is Bob Dylan and um, he's kind of a, a, a funny character, uh, Jeff Rosen is. And I said, yes, I have heard of him. Uh, what do, <laughs> he said, that, well, Larry Jenkins says you're the guy to shoot Bob Dylan. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, yeah, Larry's a genius and you should listen to him because I'd love to shoot Bob Dylan. And so anyway, I got the job to shoot Dylan and I couldn't believe it was happening and I was super, super stoked about it. And on the same day, I got a call from the woman, Sandy Charon, saying that she had gotten the book over to Bruce and that Bruce was interested in me coming out to photograph because he had just got the E Street Band back together uh, in 1999 and you know they were going to tour and they wanted a tour book. And so on the very same day, which is March 16th, which is now a national holiday at my studio. <laughs> I got a call to photograph Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen on the same day. So that was incredible. And uh, so fast forward to the the Bob Dylan shoot uh, where I felt like I wasn't even sure he was going to show up. It all seemed like a dream to me. But I found this great location called the Ambassador Hotel, which, which was uh, a legendary spot for a couple of reasons. One was um, Robert Kennedy was assassinated there in the kitchen. And it was a very sprawling, beautiful, yet sort of decrepit old hotel, like grand hotel. And the, like the tile was amazing. The carpets were cool. The walls were interesting. The the uh, light fixtures. I mean, it was just like you, every turn you could go, it would look different and offer you other more opportunities. And I thought, you know what? If I take him anywhere, this is the spot because he's probably not going to stay long and I'm going to need to stick and move and get as much stuff for them as possible uh, for them to use for publicity or uh, albums or whatever. So he showed up and I recall getting a, uh, a phone call from Larry saying, hey, you know, we're heading over, we're in the van and Bob wants to know if you're familiar with this little Walter photograph from this certain record. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I actually I play harmonica and uh, I love little Walter and I'm very familiar with that photograph and I'll set something up like that for him. It was a very simple kind of Hollywood lighting type portrait of little Walter holding his big chromatic harmonica. And I think um, so, you know, I think Bob was excited that I knew and was familiar with uh, little Walter and, and all that. And so the other thing about the place was that it was, um, they had the coconut grove room there, which was where the Rat Pack would play. Uh, of course, Sinatra and Dean Martin and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. And these, these characters that Bob held in high regard, Bob shows up to the photo shoot and we have this sort of uh, little Walter setup happening. And uh, we have a conversation about what we want to do and what my ideas were and that sort of thing. And, and, um, and I tried, you know, really hard to just keep my cool and be myself. <laughs> and, uh, and we had a great conversation I had all these CDs laid out, like a lot of country blues, a lot of blues. I love blues and I know what he likes. And I, I had done some research and knew some of his influences. And, you know, we had a good time talking about what, what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And um, when he walked away to go, you know, you know, check out his styling and things like that. He went to check his look in the mirror and like, you know, kind of had a cowboy hat on. And he was like, just 
looking in the mirror and fixing his hat. And I immediately, I just wandered over and I always have my Leica on my shoulder. And I went over and I like just shot a couple of frames of him fixing his, his hat in the mirror. And I think at that point he kind of realized that I wasn't going to be just shooting portraits here, look here at the camera, but that I was also about the document of things. And I'd set the tone for the shoot. And as we were shooting and as we were started to walk around and be shown all these different places that were historic to this really amazing old grand hotel, you know, Bob just was like super excited about being there. And we were wandering these hallways and I was just shooting away. So he would at one point he would just like turn in this hallway and just like look back at me or then he would go over by a window with a big curtain and like pull the curtain around and like he was like almost acting in this little like this little you know film in his own mind i think and and it was it was really fun and in fact you know i i hope one of these uh, one of these years when the timing's right i honestly could that photo shoot is so diverse in like the type of cameras that i was using and the type of you know, moments I captured from Hollywood portraits to long atmospheric photographs of him walking through a door, like, in, you know, with a open shutter speed and blurry motion and, you know, shooting with like my, my old Polaroid camera and my Wadalux camera and my half frame camera. Like I was just like going for it. It's like the whole thing is, is it's not very repetitive. It's not like you could look at it and they all feel the same. It feels like a really a big sort of expansive shoot and it was all done in like a probably six or seven hours. He was really oh. supposed to be there for, he committed to like being there for four hours. And I figured, you know, between, st you know, getting himself together and, you know, deciding on what clothes to wear and things like that, maybe I'd have like three hours with him, but he ended up staying for like six or seven hours. That's amazing. Yeah. And the, the shoot ended when I had bounced this light into the ceiling. It was like an HMI light that I bounced into the ceiling just to create a little bit of, of light there. And I had done that photograph of him uh, right at the end where he's reading the newspaper, the Spanish language newspaper, and his shoes are up on the table. When I was shooting that, he looked out from underneath the uh, the paper, which we had gotten a bunch of newspapers because we wanted to give him something to do. We had talked about we have him writing lyrics and we have him reading the paper and like have him you know, just doing a couple of things just to give it like a documentary feel. Um, he looked out from behind the paper and said, hey, you know, are you getting my shoes? Like, I really like these shoes. <laughs> and of course I was because I had a 20 millimeter lens on and I was getting everything. And uh, I just – I'll never forget that moment where he peeks out from behind the paper and asks me if I was getting his shoes. And so I was like – at the end, I was like, uh, gosh, we had been there for – six hours, seven hours. And I'm like, I can't believe he's still here. And I pulled out my old Polaroid camera and I wanted to get a photograph of his hands holding this old chromatic harmonica. And so I'm focusing on his hands and the shoots sort of been going on for a while now. And I pull out my old Polaroid camera to do a portrait of his hands holding this big chromatic harmonica. And as I'm focusing, the light just kind of like made a funny noise and just went out like, bzzz. <laughs> and the light went out and we're all like kind of standing there in like almost complete darkness. And Bob said, well, I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, we're done. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We'll have part two of our conversation with Danny Clinch available next week. And if you loved what you heard, Please, please spread the word by sharing it in your social networks, be they Twitter, Facebook, or Google+. Please remember that you do make a big difference to our show. Take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. It helps increase our ranking and creates greater awareness of the show. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the candid frame website. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free candid frame app available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows 8. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.